Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's Message of the Week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. Hi, I'm Ben. For those of you that don't know me, you would probably recognize me better if I had my hat on. (laughs) My hair looks ridiculous like all of ours, but uh, the truth is I just put it on because I couldn't be bothered to fix it. Um, I do have hair. I do fix it occasionally. This is the privilege today. Um, How are you? Hopefully it's been a good week for you guys. It's, um, gosh, April 1st on Thursday, looking out over our yard. We've got cherry trees blooming and it's beautiful. It's our favorite time of the year. God's just so good. I love to see the way he he works in and through his creation. Well, we're going to be talking today about uh, continuing in our series in James. James chapter 3 is where we are. Um, verse starting with verse 13. You might not know this, but uh, James, uh, the church has actually had a fairly uh, tempestuous relationship with James at various times. I don't know if you know this or not, like Martin Luther, the famous Protestant reformer, actually really disliked the book of James. Like, really disliked the book of James. (laughs) And uh, uh, so, You know, I hope through the series as we've been studying this that we've made clear that, uh, you know, his argument was it confuses the issue of salvation by faith alone. I hope that as we've been preaching through this and teaching through this, we've made it really clear that that actually that's not true at all. And in fact, it's actually quite a simple lesson. And if you zoom out to the 60,000 foot view um, in James, his lesson, his, his message, his story is actually quite simple. And I'll tell it to you now. You ready? 500 years of church conflict resolved on this Sunday morning. You ready? Here we go. Apple trees make apples. Apple trees make apples. That's what apple trees do. If you had an apple tree and it didn't make apples or it made walnuts or it made goats, I don't know. That was a random example. I don't know how an apple tree would make a goat, but if it did, that would be weird, right? Apple trees make apples. That's that's James's point, really. And uh, we don't need to make it that complex. Heidi Baker, a uh, famous evangelist in Mozambique, said, uh, love looks like something. And that's true for James's point throughout the entire book of James. Our faith in Christ looks like something that other people can experience and interact with. Uh, and if not, maybe, maybe we don't have faith in Christ. That's his point. So let's have a look at the passage. Susio, if you want to put that up, we're starting in uh, James chapter 3, verse 13. And here we go, reading from the uh, NIV. Yep. So who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. If you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven, interesting, is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, Submissive, your translation translation may say, full of mercy and good fruit. Wow, key word, key word there. Impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. That's a great verse. So uh, I have another mind-blowing revelation for you to start with. Are you ready? <laughs> This might change everything for you. This is a really important part of setting the scene for what we're going to talk about in James. Okay, here we go. Wise does not necessarily mean godly. Wow, what does that mean? We need to unpack that a bit, right? Wise does not necessarily mean godly. So think back to uh, Genesis chapter 3. It says that the snake was crafty or cunning. Now, I know that's a different word. It's not the word wisdom, but in Isaiah and Job and in Paul, they all relate that theme of craftiness or cunning back to wisdom. An even better example in uh, chapter three of Genesis is with Eve. She said that she saw that the uh, eating of the tree was good for gaining wisdom. The eating of the tree, the tree of life, the, the, the tree that God said not to eat from was good for gaining 
wisdom. And then eight times, actually, throughout uh, the Bible, if you search, you'll see this phrase, wise in your own eyes. He was wise in his own eyes. Don't be wise in your own eyes. <clears throat> it's constant throughout the Bible, and it's actually used as a reference in every single instance to foolishness or arrogance. Uh, so what we see actually in the Bible from start to finish is there is this contrast, and James does it here as well. There's a contrast between a godly wisdom and an earthly or foolish or destructive wisdom. There's a contrast between godly wisdom and foolish or destructive wisdom. In other, in other words, there's a kind of wisdom that produces godly outcomes, godly fruit, if you like. There's a kind of wisdom that's actually earthly in nature that produces bad fruit. It produces destruction. It produces confusion. It, it leads to all kinds of ungodly things. So this is an example that we see throughout Scripture. I'll give you uh, an example from my, from my own work. Uh, now, I work in uh, cybersecurity. This is the field that I work in. I work for Microsoft in their consulting uh, team in cybersecurity. <clears throat> and I'm often, uh, just because of the nature of working for a company like that, I'm often um, working with some of the biggest customers, very large banks. The bank that you bank with, probably, <laughs> I've met with them. Uh, I'm often in situations that feel beyond me where I actually, I don't know what to do. Uh, sometimes uh, customers find themselves in situations that they don't know how to get up, get out of, and I wouldn't tell them this, but actually I don't either. <laughs> I need wisdom. That's the whole point. I need wisdom. So oftentimes what I do is I will actually step back from that situation that is very confusing or very difficult, and I'll take it back to principles. Uh, what are the priorities or the courses of action that I know from experience produce positive or beneficial outcomes. Uh, I'll give you an example. In, in the cybersecurity world, there is a, a principle called assume breach. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. If you work in IT, you might have heard that, assume breach. And essentially what assume breach means in this day and age is it means um, the question is not if you're going to get hacked, the question is when. So you better be ready for it, right? Because assume breach means you operate from the perspective of this is going to happen to me, so I'd better be ready when it does, okay? Now, I often work with customers that don't operate by this principle. In other words, they have a kind of wisdom. Their wisdom says, actually, uh, what, what I would call the M&M or the Smarties approach to cybersecurity, which is a very hard outer shell, but a very soft and gooey center, okay? That's a bad idea. <laughs> so their approach is we're going to funnel all of our attention, all of our money into keeping people out. And then what happens, though, inevitably, is that something happens and you know, some hacker gets inside their bank or something like that. And they don't know what to do. Why don't they know what to do? Well, they didn't plan for that. They were simply focused on the hard outer shell. They don't know what to do once someone gets on the inside. So by adopting what we would call an assume breach mentality, you operate from the perspective that this is going to happen and we need to be ready when it does. And so what that means is you invest in ways to detect when someone's doing bad things and you invest in ways to recover when something bad happens. OK, so if you think of it again, this contrast of uh, of a wisdom that produces good fruit and a wisdom that produces bad fruit or bad outcomes. OK. Uh, the assume breach mentality sets a trajectory that actually enables businesses to recover in a timely way. But this other kind of wisdom, right? And you might actually even see the word wisdom with quotes, air quotes in your, in, in your translation, actually produces an outcome that is actually very unhelpful. Uh, and this is actually the theme that James is emphasizing, not cybersecurity, but the, the, the compare and the contrast between a wisdom that produces good outcomes, godly outcomes, and a wisdom that produces uh, bad outcomes. And if you look in the passage, he actually gives some examples. He says bad wisdom, earthly wisdom. He calls it earthly. He calls it unspiritual wisdom. He even calls it demonic. It says even demonic wisdom contrasted with uh, godly wisdom, which is heavenly. That's a word that he uses. Um, it's spiritual. 
And if demonic means that it's uh, opposed to the character and purposes of God, then godly wisdom is that wisdom which is aligned with God's character and purposes. Okay, so how do we tell the difference? This is this is a question as we we think about how to make this more practical. How do we tell the difference between the two? Uh, and we've kind of already talked about it a little bit. Actually, this is the language that James uses. Uh, In verse 17, he uses the word fruit. The answer for how you tell the difference between godly wisdom and earthly or carnal or demonic wisdom, destructive wisdom, is the fruit that each bear. This is the word that James uses. Uh, Now, a great um, verse to use for this outside of James, actually Jesus himself, in uh, Matthew chapter 11, Jesus said this really interesting statement. He said, wisdom is vindicated by her children. In other words, wisdom is proven to be right by her deeds. Okay, so if you if you have this picture of uh, a seed, you plant it in the ground, it grows a tree, that tree grows fruit, which we can then interact with and experience, right? You can walk out into your yard. If you have an apple tree, if you have a lemon tree, you can taste the fruit and you can see if it's good or not, okay? And this is his point, is that uh, wisdom, godly wisdom produces fruit uh, that tastes really good. It it is godly in nature. Uh, And actually there's uh, there's an element of being able to interact with and experience the wisdom of God made manifest in a person's life. So you could almost actually say, if we're wise, other people will know it. So uh, you could uh, think of it in this way. We've actually been experiencing, in some ways, the fruit of Adam and Eve's wisdom ever since. But thank God there's actually even a higher truth, right? We have been experiencing the fruit of God's wisdom ever since. There's a famous uh, choral piece that I really love that uh, John Rudder uh, uh, arranged, and it's called, it's actually called Jesus Christ, the Apple Tree. You ever heard that? Anyone ever heard that? Yeah, Lucy. Jesus Christ, the Apple Tree. It's this picture, again, of you plant a seed, it bears fruit, it, it, it grows into a tree which bears fruit, which is good fruit. And that is really James's point, is when you contrast good wisdom and ungodly wisdom, destructive wisdom, how you know the difference is the fruit that it bears. <clears throat> so if we uh, start to think about kind of how to make it practical, some kind of tips for the real world, um, like my job, I don't always know what to do, but I do know the seeds that produce good fruit. And James actually gives us a list in verse 17. So if you're not sure that you know uh, what some of the seeds are that produce good fruit, what godly wisdom realized looks like, James actually gives us a great list. So if you look, if you've got your got your app and you look at verse 17, there's actually a great list that he gives us. The first one that he mentions is pure. Godly wisdom is pure. Uh, the next one is a great one for this day and age, peace-loving. Uh, think drama, okay? Think uh, you're in a scenario where uh, you have to respond to something that's maybe happening around you, and uh, you have a choice about how to respond. Will you respond in a way that stirs up drama in the community of people? Will you respond in a way that produces godly fruit, which James says is a peace-loving fruit. It actually produces peace in its output. Uh, The next one, depending on your translation, will say gentle, or it could say considerate. Uh, This is a great um, example, I think, this passage of the importance of studying the word for yourself. If you, you might not know this word, but it's called interlinear. If you've never looked at an interlinear Bible, if you Google online, sir, uh, like if you typed in, for example, James 3.17 interlinear, what it will do is it'll bring up um, the original text, and then it will show for each word in the original language how it's been translated. And the reason I mention that is that this next word says gentle or considerate, depending on your translation. Neither one are actually a great translation of what James is trying to convey here. He's almost using a kind of um, a legal term. Um, 
the, the context of the word he's using here actually means uh, relaxing overly strict standards in order to keep the spirit of the law. Have you ever heard of that? Like um, someone who's obsessed with keeping the letter of the law, but they're not necessarily keeping the spirit of the law. And James's point here is actually um, a godly wisdom is someone who can see through keeping the rules, not being pedantic about the rules, but actually recognizing the spirit of the law. Maybe someone did something that wasn't very smart, but they did it with the right intention. They were trying to do the right thing. Being able to see through the letter of the law to the spirit of the law um, is a great example of godly wisdom. The next one, same thing. It's translated as either reasonable or submissive. Um, neither is a great word. Again, actually, that word submissive gets a bit tricky for us in this, in this day and age, right? But actually what it means is willing to yield. Willing to yield. Um, persuadable. So if you're in a situation to where uh, you need to respond to something that's happening in your life and you really want to respond in a way that is wise in a godly sense, here's a great, a great one to think about. I mean, Paul, <clears throat> this is an amazing word. When Paul was talking about believers suing one another, you know, taking one another to court, he made this amazing statement. It just blows my mind. He said, why not just choose to be wronged? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> what a great word. Why not just choose to be wronged? Okay, are you willing to yield? Are you persuadable? Uh, actually, James says this is an example of godly wisdom. Um, we should aspire to that. Uh, the next one is full of mercy and good fruit. There's that word. Um, the seed that grows into a tree which bears fruit that other people can experience and see and taste that it's good. Um, impartiality is another one, uh, depending on your translation, that you'll see. Now, this word, again, is, it's not a great example of the original intent of the language. The original intent of the language means undivided. It means wholehearted. I mean, I really want the fruit of that godly wisdom in my life, don't you? Don't you want to be undivided in your devotion to Jesus? Don't you want to be undivided and wholehearted in your devotion to Jesus? I do. I want the fruit of that godly wisdom to be made manifest in my life. And the last one uh, that James mentions, at least, is translated in the NIV as sincere. And it really means no hidden agenda no ulterior motive. Uh, so you're in a situation to where you have to respond. You might feel a draw in, for some reason, whatever that reason is, to, to respond in such a way that you can kind of control the outcome. It's a little bit manipulative. It's a hidden agenda. It's an ulterior motive. And actually what James is saying is godly wisdom actually is that which does not have a hidden agenda. It doesn't have an ulterior motive. It's pure, which is the very first word that he used. It's sincere. It's not hypocritical. So those are some of the seeds, if you will, that James actually gives us in this passage so that if we're not sure, we can always plant these seeds. If you plant these seeds, if you plant an apple seed, you will get an apple tree, which bears apples as its fruit, okay? And if you plant these seeds, um, you will get godly wisdom as the product. So uh, how do we do it? You know, how do we get wise? So I'm in situations all the time, as I mentioned in my work, where I'm aware, uh, this is part of the fun of, I think, partnering with God um, to see his kingdom come on the earth. It's, it's, it's one of the reasons I love working in the business world and the marketplace is because it's this fun experiment where you get to partner with God to see his kingdom come. But the consequence is you he puts you in places because of his favor and his purposes. He puts you in places that you are very aware are beyond you. <laughs> like you just find yourself in situations to where you're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm here, but he knows what he's doing. And it, it, it really reinforces this wonderful opportunity that we have to actually take a step back and press into that and say, Jesus, this feels over my head, but it's not over yours. And you have wisdom that you want to bring into this circumstance. And some of these seeds, perhaps relationally, and things that you're working with people actually, are great seeds that you could plant if you don't know what to do. Uh, so, so how do we get wise? 
um, we know that wisdom seems to be a thing that great leaders value, right? Um, when God asked Solomon what, what he wanted, Solomon said, I would like to be wise. So we know that wisdom is something that great leaders value. How do we get wise, as it were? Well, the first uh, thing, I was raised um, in a Southern Baptist church, so I'm going to give you three things, and they're all going to begin with the letter A. <laughs> I worked really hard on this. Uh, the first one is, actually, we talked about it in James chapter 1. The Bible answers its own questions, right? The very first thing you should do if you want to get wise, James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks, lacks wisdom, you should ask. Ask is the first word. It says, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Wisdom. Um, I love the part here where it says, uh, he gives it to us generally without finding fault. Um, he doesn't chastise us for not knowing what to do. <laughs> Isn't that good? Like, I, 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 feel a, I feel a relief in those situations when I find myself in over my head, when I remind myself that I'm not in this situation because I have all the answers. I'm in this situation because he has all the answers, right? Um, if your kids came to you and said, Mom, Dad, would you please share some of your wisdom with me? I have a difficult decision to make and I don't know what to do. Would you chastise them? Of course you wouldn't. This would be great. It would be like, it's an expression of wisdom that they're even asking the question, right? Uh, so um, he gives uh, if we ask. So the first one is ask. The second one is accept. Accept. James 1.5, it says, and he will provide if you ask. He will provide. And I love that um, uh, this theme we've been on all morning, and Adam mentioned we started it in really in our prayer time, this theme of the old man and the new man. When we ask for wisdom, God says in James 1, 5, I will give it to you. So don't second guess that, okay? I just want to remind you that God is not in the business of trying to fix up your old man. Your old man in Christ is dead. He's not resurrecting the old guy. He's not, you're not lugging the body around with you, trying to put lipstick on it and makeup, right? You are dead. Your old nature died with him, but unlike him, it did not get resurrected. Your old man is dead. You have been given the mind of Christ in Jesus. You have been given the mind of Christ. You have been given all things pertaining to godliness and wisdom. My Father has made everything about his kingdom known to you. So when we pray for wisdom, we accept by faith, number one, that he's going to give it to us because he said that he would. And number two, that it is in us. It is in us, okay? Jesus is in us. So his nature, his character, is, as Adam said, we're not sinners anymore. We're saints. His nature and character, his value system, it is in us. It will come out of us naturally. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't still have to unlearn uh, you know, years of bad behaviors and all that kind of stuff, but he has changed us. Our old man is dead. He is not fixing up the old man, okay? So ask, accept in faith that he's going to provide that wisdom and has provided that wisdom through Christ. The third one is act. Ask, accept, and act. Okay, so I don't know, this is you, you're praying, you're in a situation. I don't know if I'm wise or if I know how to draw, you know, from this godly wisdom that's within me. You might feel like that sometimes, just being honest. But I do know what it looks like when godly wisdom is manifest. James has given us some of those seeds here. I know what it looks like when godly wisdom is manifest. So I'm just going to do those things. And it's, 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 it's practicing. Uh, when I'm in those work circumstances now, I often don't have to think consciously about going back to those principles and, and building from there. It just kind of happens because I do it a lot. So take these principles, take these seeds of wisdom that James has given us, and if you don't feel like you know what to do, you know you can always plant these. Act. So we're asking God for wisdom. We're accepting the reality that he is and has provided it to us, and then we're acting on those 
on those things that he's given us to plant so that they will they will bear fruit that is godly and not fruit that is kind of over here and not very good. Um, so those are the three things that we talked about today. Um, I think it's been a really fun uh, study through James. It's one of those uh, books where uh, you read it again and you're like, oh, I forgot that verse was in James. This is great. <laughs> so I hope you've been enjoying it.